welcome to uh, everyone who is watching online this morning. Uh, if you are uh, new or visiting, uh, especially a warm welcome to you at this time. There are a number of announcements that were e uh, emailed out earlier in the week along with the uh, bulletin. Uh, and just to say that if you do watch online or if you are attending here and do not receive uh, those weekly emails with the announcements, uh, please contact the office. Uh, if you would like to receive those by email. There's uh, announcements this week in regards to the Lenten envelopes, to our prayer shawl ministry here at Woodlawn, uh, and a special announcement uh, for a youth day that's coming up. So please take the time to read through those and to read through any announcements for you may find something that interests you. Uh, condolences are shared this day to the friends and families and all who mourn the loss of Hans Udenby, of Olvia Vincent, and Jerry Nelson. And we give thanks for their lives. We give thanks for the love that was shared because they lived and were in faith. We give thanks for the love that holds them still. And we hold all who mourn their loss in our prayers during this time. Friends, as we gather in this place, we remember with gratitude uh, that we live and worship on the lands that are by law the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq. May we live on this land with respect and in peace and in friendship with its people. And as God calls us into this place, let us now worship God. Here on this first Sunday of Lent, the colors have changed and we see the purple Lenten candles marking each uh, Sunday that lay ahead on this journey. We have the beautiful banners uh, that now adorn this sanctuary and these purple flowers here that remind us of Christ's journey to the cross uh, when the, he was adorned by Pilate with a purple robe. And now we are called to share this journey, to remember this journey, and to consider life where God meets us. We are called to consider and wait where God feeds us. We are called not to think less of ourselves, but to think of ourselves less and consider how much God thinks of us. For in Jesus, God meets us with a steadfast love and faithfulness, seeking to share a journey that leads to a cross. There is an invitation to follow, an opportunity to grow in the spirit and walk with a God who is near, who is with us in all times and in all places, especially in this sacred time of service and of praise. So let us worship the God who calls us by name. And I invite you to stand as we reflect on the words of number 161, I have called you by your name, and if you would like to hum along, please feel free to do so.
Please be seated. Friends, as we gather, we gather in the light of Christ, knowing that Christ shines with a light that is in us, a light that is for us, illuminating the way to everlasting life. I invite you to bow your heads and let us breathe deeply and let us pray together. Eternal and everlasting God in whom we live and move and have our being, as your people we gather today, some gather in this sanctuary, some gather at home, wherever we are, may we uh, know your light. And may we feel that deeper connection to you and to each other. That this time of worship, this time we give back to you, might be for us a time in which you serve us by your grace, by your wisdom, and by your mercy. That we might find ourselves drawn closer to you, that we might discover your presence in our midst, that we might become the people you have called us to be through Christ Jesus, a people of love, of justice, of mercy and peace. And so as we gather, we pray in his name, in the strength of the Spirit. Amen. season of Lent is a season of uh, almsgiving, of uh, penitence, a time of renewal as we turn to God and we open our hearts in confession. And so let us pray. Gracious God, we admit that in our lives there are times when we are all too aware of our limitations conscious of our shortcomings and the distance between us and others. So in moments when words fail us, remind us at times that there is nothing that can compete with a heartfelt sorry. For as the author of life, it is only you who can read and understand the language of our hearts. Only you who can translate our sorry into the prayer we should have prayed if we had had the words within us. And then you forgive, and having forgiven, you surround us in an embrace of love, seeking seeking to draw us close to your heart, as it was always meant to be, that we might be free to love again. So thank you, God, that we can open our hearts to you in confession and give us the confidence of faith to receive your gift of forgiveness. Amen. Friends, we have called out to God, and God hears our cries. God is merciful in spirit, for as Christ shared with those who listened. God does not come into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might have everlasting life. Let us believe in the good news and rejoice. Good morning, and welcome to Woodlawn United Church. My name is Katie, and we are so excited to have you here. As you can tell, I'm not here in person. Every single week, we have in-person Sunday school and youth group over in the Heritage Center. So if you would like to take part in that, just send me an email at youth.coordinator at woodlawnunited.ca, 
and we can get you all set up and registered. All right, now let's move on to our scripture for the week. Today's scripture comes from Mark 1, verses 9 to 15. And in this tiny little bit of text is three major parts of Jesus' life. So we start with a really big moment for Jesus was when he went to get baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. And that was a pretty big moment for him because when Jesus was baptized, first it was amazing because John was like you and me and he baptized the savior of the world. And that's pretty amazing that someone as ordinary as John could reach out and baptize him. It was a really important moment. And so Jesus, when he was being baptized, was told, this is my beloved son by God. And everybody heard. Can you imagine that? Hearing the voice of God. It's pretty remarkable. And the second thing that happened in Jesus' big three events in this part of the Bible was that he went into the wilderness for 40 days and he was tempted and taunted and he was forced to live with these wild animals and it was really, really hard, but he did it and he had faith in God the whole time and it really strengthened his relationship with God. Now the third thing was the moment that Jesus decided it was time to start his ministry. His exact words were, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So what Jesus is saying here is that it's time for him to deliver his ministry to the world. And it's time for him to show everybody that he is the son of God and that he is ready to help us learn and to grow and to become better people. And I think that's pretty amazing that he reached out and decided that this is the time, and it was the right time, and how God seems to know when the right time is for us. Thank you for joining me for this week's story time. Now, before we go, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for knowing when's the right time for us. Thank you for delivering your gospel to us and for giving us your son to teach us and to guide us. We are so grateful for you and we hope to live our lives in the way that you taught us with love, kindness, and compassion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. I'll see you next week. Bye. work doesn't always pay off. Around the world, many people work hard and still can't feed their families. Your gifts through mission and service turn hard work into true hope for the future. Thanks to your support, resourceful people like Margaret Kagundu have the opportunity not just to survive, but to thrive. Margaret and her children live in Nyeri, Kenya. In some parts of Kenya, people live in inadequate housing, without running water, and with very little access to health care. Margaret struggled to meet her family's basic needs before she received a microloan from a lending program supported through your gifts to mission and service called Jami Imara, meaning a strong community. 2004 is when I joined this project. I was given the first loan. I had saved and I was given a loan of 2,000 shillings. I benefited a lot from that 2,000 shillings. I started a small business of selling vegetables. I was granted 10,000 shillings four times. Having been given the 10,000 shillings four times, I cleared and went on to get 20,000 shillings until I built these houses. I built these two houses for renting out. I have even started keeping goats that reproduce. I have educated my children. There is even one who has started Form 1. I sold the goats that I had and took him to Form 1. He is now in high school. Supporting women like Margaret, who are determined to change their lives, is just one of the ways that you are helping turn hard work into hope every day. 
There are many women who want to join the group because they see that I have progressed a lot. I am no longer the way I was before. Thank you for your generosity to the mission and service of the United Church of Canada. Please make a gift today. Thank you, Gus. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. And early on, especially in Mark's Gospel, things uh, happen in a hurry. There's, the word immediately is used a lot, uh, you might discover, if you read through the Gospel. Uh, and today's uh, text is no different as it comes from the first chapter of, gospel, of uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, verses 9 to 15. And... Uh, in the other Gospels, when we hear of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, uh, there's a lot more detail given, uh, not so much in this text, uh, where actually we find Jesus shifting locations three times. First, he's out in the Jordan being baptized by John. Then he's in the wilderness being tempted. And then he's beginning his ministry in Galilee. And so let us hear again these words from the Gospel of Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Here ends the reading. May God bless these words unto our hearts and unto our understanding. Let us pray. O holy God, as we gather 
we offer you words of praise. We raise up prayers from our hearts and we reflect on your word to us in the scriptures. And now as we gather our hearts and our minds and as we pray, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you. And that they be for us a word of life, uh, the very same word we encounter in Christ Jesus. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. So recently I was re- uh, listening on the radio to a, a podcast And it was a podcast, and it told a story about researchers uh, who were at a place that you might consider to be like one of the edges of the earth. I don't believe in a flat earth, by the way, but it's just, you know, a figure of speech, right? And it's known as the Research Station Concordia, and it's located pretty much near the center of Antarctica. And it's uh, in the midst of one of the harshest climates on the planet. It's a place where, for a lot of the year, there's 24-hour darkness. With the wind chill, temperatures can reach a minus 100 Celsius. And because it's four kilometers above sea level, the air is really thin and it can be hard to breathe. It's a place where life can seem impossible. There's a researcher there. His name is Dr. Alexander Kumar. And uh, he's a man referred to as having the loneliest job on earth. And at research uh, station Concordia, is Dr. Kumar is trying to understand the physical and the psychological effects of isolation. In, pic- in particular, why he's doing this is because he wants to understand the impact of extreme isolation when it comes to the possibility of humans traveling to Mars. Because the biggest obstacle, he says, when it comes to deep space travel isn't technological. We all know that because we had that, that uh, probe that landed on Mars this past week. We can get there. But one of the issues is the impact and the effects of isolation on sending humans there. And so isolation, you see, you get it in its rawest form at Research Station Concordia. Some of his fellow researchers there say things like, you know, being there for an extended time, they feel dead. They feel as if uh, things just aren't real. They describe it as living in the prison of your own mind. Even their senses change and they begin to overreact to the slightest stimuli. And they call Antarctica in that station White Mars. Now I appreciate that we might have difficulty Uh, relating to that environment, but maybe not because the weather has been pretty bad this past month. But there are times when we do and we can feel cut off from so much, removed from the regular rhythms of life. Our senses can change. I mean, this pandemic time can certainly do that to a person. I mean, even when we're surrounded by others, right? Even when there's a world of activity out there, we can still experience loneliness. And you can begin to feel as if you're living on another planet. It's the isolating effect that comes when we find ourselves living on the edge of life. And you know, Jesus was an expert when it came to life on the edges. In fact, you know, maybe that title, The Loneliest Job on Earth, Well, that could have belonged to Jesus. After all, his role as a Messiah and as a Savior was his. It was his alone. And in this text from the Gospel of Mark, we see how he journeys along the edges of life. And they were there, that journey was there at the beginning of his ministry. Even when he goes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. I mean, he's out in the desert. He's far removed from Jerusalem and the activity of the city. And that spot where John was baptizing people was likely near where God's people had crossed over, you know, after they had been led through the wilderness by Moses generations before. And when they entered into the promised land, 
right? Geographically, being out there in the Jordan, that's a place that's on the edge of the land related to God's people. And then from there we hear how Jesus is led into the wilderness. And this is a time of extended isolation. He's out there for 40 days. He could have easily felt as if he was living on another planet there. 40 days alone with his thoughts. The text says he was tempted by Satan, and there were wild beasts. Now the word Satan in the Hebrew, it literally means adversary. I mean, Satan was this power that that instigates tests or trials in human beings, a power so real that it became personified. And I know, you know, that a lot of us, uh, you know, when we hear the word Satan, we get this image of that, you know, that red fellow with the horns and the tail and the pitchfork. But that image did not exist here in Jesus' day. But what did exist for him was that real temptation. And it's a temptation that any of us can face when we find ourselves on life's edges place where certain thoughts and feelings can threaten to devour a person like a wild beast. A place where we can experience those isolating effects of anger, of fear, of envy, of abandonment, and so on, and feel even more on the edge. And as Jesus shows us in this text... Right, living in that shadow of death on the edge of existence. It doesn't just happen out in the wilderness. When he goes to Galilee to begin his ministry, calling disciples, teaching and healing people, Jesus, he isn't out of the woods yet. He begins his ministry, as the text notes, in the shadow of John the Baptist being arrested. I mean, remember, John was the one who had been preparing the people for Jesus' arrival. He had even baptized Jesus. Jesus and John were known associates. So even then, even when there's so much, pe- so many people around, and there were dangers. There were still powers that would seek to isolate and imprison Jesus. He was always on the edges of life. I mean, I don't think it's that much different for him these days. But You know, for any of us, I mean, even when we can be surrounded by, you know, have lots to do and we can hear the news and the chatter, I mean, we still live in a a world that can push anyone to the limits and experience life on the edge, right? We can be confronted by those same feelings, those dangers, You, you know, think of, you know, being afraid, anxious, Feelings of envy, of guilt even, despair. We can become isolated. And it can test the very limits of our humanity and our faith. And I know, you know, over the years, uh, there's always been certain occupations and certain individuals uh, that can have, uh, you know, a higher uh, level of isolation people in leadership roles, uh, police officers, judges, doctors, dentists, even clergy. They speak of the isolating effects of their vocation. But these days we know, and research has shown, that social isolation is a growing problem. Right, and the pandemic hasn't helped. We all know this. For example, you know, now that more people work from home or learn from home, social interaction that was a part of the workplace or a part of the classroom. It's muted or it's absent. Some who were excellent students or model employees are now struggling. And the edges of life are closer than they used to be. I mean, yes, technology can help us to overcome uh, some of the isolating effects that have been brought upon us and keep us connected, but not everyone has the knowledge or the skill or the money to adapt to new technology. Besides, you know, I think as much as technology promises to keep us connected, you know, I think of emails, they can be safe and they can be convenient. It's still no uh, substitution for having a real conversation with someone, is it? Because deep down we are social creatures, right? We're biologically hardwired by evolution to seek companionship, 
and relationship. And no matter how independent sometimes in life we want to appear, most of us, we know the truth that we need each other to survive. And thus when those fragile bonds of a social system uh, become disrupted, you know, it's, we can feel threatened, our survival. Depression and anxiety can set in. And it's something we all need to be aware of as this pandemic time wears on. Because any one of us can find ourselves on the edges of life, isolated and alone. I mean, but even before the pandemic, we didn't live in a world that needed more isolation. I mean, if anything, we've always needed less. And, and, and now I think we're, we're being called not only to mitigate the coronavirus itself, but take seriously the effects of the isolation that so many are experiencing en masse. I mean, it's ironic, you know, in recent years, the federal government was doing a lot of work and instituted uh, much-needed reforms regarding the relegation and care of prisoners, right, in federal prisons who were placed into solitary. They changed the regulations because they knew it wasn't a good thing. And then, you know, all of a sudden, en masse, you know, our country, the world, we're struck with a pandemic, and now we're all being isolated in some, in some way. Maybe, maybe the isolation can draw us closer together and closer to God. Maybe it will build an awareness and an understanding in regards to isolation as we faced its impact. I mean, I think of ones who struggle with mental illness, for example. I mean, mental illness is so often, if not always, accompanied by a sense, a feeling of isolation. And it's only compounded because people do not want to acknowledge or talk about it. I mean, I look at some of the numbers I've read during the pandemic. There are adults that, you know, even though they acknowledge they're having a tough time and that perhaps their mental health needs are higher, they still aren't accessing the services and the supports that are in place. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to admit it, and we feel isolated. And, and we become even more out of touch on the edge. You know, over the years, I've uh, facilitated grief groups. And in any group, almost, I believe, that I've been a part of, at least one participant will always note how when they've gone through that period of grief or loss in their life, that one of their most profound experiences is a sense of isolation. Right? Living, and they say this, I feel like I'm on the outside or I was on the outside looking in. Someone in the group will say things like, people don't want to talk about it. You know, uh, you don't want to talk about it. You know, people are afraid of, you know, getting upset or making somebody upset or, or being seen as weak. And, you know, whenever someone shares that, other participants will usually nod their heads in agreement because they experience the same thing. Think about it, because this past year has been a time when many have endured significant loss in their life. Loss of loved ones, loss of employment, loss of relationships, loss of activity, of security, of freedom. The loss of people and of things that have helped define who we are. And suddenly the edges of life aren't so far away. They are near. I mean, the edge of life, it was always near for Jesus. But even though Jesus, you know, even though he was always on the edges, there's something he came to show us and remind us is how God was always along those edges with them. That he knew God was near. Right, when he was baptized in the Jordan by John, it was a place where he heard the words, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. I mean, God was with him there, out on the edge, expressing hope for Jesus. And in the wilderness, you know, where the wild beasts were lurking, and Jesus had to face Satan, 
text says that he was led by the Spirit and that angels waited on him. I mean, in other words, right, God was there too out in the wilderness. I mean, as one observer I read notes, he he reminds us, you know, that this text, it says something along the lines that our well-being comes in our nearness to God, you know, not in keeping distance from our enemies. You know, sometimes we just want to keep our distance thinking that'll make things better. When really what makes things better is that nearness of God. And I think, you know, when we speak of uh, our nearness to God, uh, it would be better and more apt and more biblically appropriate to say God's nearness to us. Because Jesus reminds us of this, that God is there on the edges of that it is God who draws near to us. I mean, this was his message when he went to Galilee to proclaim the good news of God after John was arrested. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Jesus' trust in the nearness of God is one of the defining marks of his ministry. He was always reaching out to the ones who found themselves in isolation, seeking to restore their relationship and place within God's realm. That God, the spirit of light, hope for us, could be present in any place and in anyone at the very edges of life itself. You know... I cannot begin to tell you over my years of ministry how many times, you know, I've met individuals who, after facing a period of great trial or difficulty, times when they felt cut off from those who were closest to them, moments when they felt perhaps as if they were on another planet, they said things like this to me. They say, you know, there's no way I would have gotten through that if it weren't for my faith. You know, I've heard those words, and I suspect you have heard them too, and maybe you've even said them. That there's no way I could have ever gotten through that if it weren't for my faith in God. Now, I, I can appreciate how a person without faith would scratch their head and, and wonder what another means by that. <clears throat> but I also know that as a person of faith, when you hear someone they'll say those words... You know what they mean. Even if you can't completely articulate and put the words around it. But we have all faced those times and those trials in our lives where even though we have felt isolated and and we're walking a fine line, we knew we were not alone in it. That there is the faith and the promise of a God to see us through. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, when I was isolating in, in relative comfort, I might add, because I had to go through that quarantine period, I had a chance to watch a few movies. And one of them was a movie I had seen before. It had been a while, though, the movie The Martian. I it was appropriate that I got to watch it. And it's a fictional, fictional account about uh, this astronaut that gets uh, stranded on Mars after an accident and his fellow crew members had to leave and they left them behind. And it's actually the movie's based on a book that goes into a deeper description of this abandoned astronaut's Christian faith and his time in prayer and how it sustained him in his isolation. Well, there's a scene in the movie and, and maybe you can picture it. It's when this abandoned astronaut, you know, in his attempt to survive, he's looking for something that he can start a fire with or create a fire. And he finds his fellow, a fellow astronaut's crucifix, a wooden crucifix that had been also left behind. And he uh, takes his knife and produces a few wood shavings off this wooden crucifix in order to help build his fire. But before he does this, he, he stops And he takes a look at the crucifix. And maybe he's pondering, I wonder, you know, Jesus' isolation and abandonment on the cross and, and thinking of his own situation in that moment of being alone. And he looks at Jesus 
and he says, you know, given my current circumstances, I'm sure you won't mind. I'm counting on you. You see that scene, it's an acknowledgement of his need, not only for a fire starter, but for real survival and for hope beyond himself that could save him from his isolation. When the temptation was to feel alone and much of what he was feeling could have devoured him, he had the gift of believing he was not alone, that it wasn't all up to him. Those words were an open confession an acknowledgement that God was near as hope for his survival. And you know, that kind of confession, that acknowledgement of our dependency on another for survival, it's not unlike something that that Dr. Kumar in, in, at the research station in uh, Antarctica said at the end of his interview. He, he noted that crucial to survival when I, in isolation is a sense of camaraderie, of connection. That when we can find ways to nurture relationships, when we can see our need for each other and confess it, there will always be hope. I mean, even along the edges, when it can be hard to connect, and we are tempted to go alone or believe we are alone as a people of faith, We don't forsake our relationships, especially our relationship with God. If we are to survive, we grow in these connections. We are healed by these connections. We find life in them. They are hope for us, for all of us. We discover that God is near. But this is the way of Jesus. It's what he embodies in his humanity, right? In his life, his death, his resurrection, he goes to the edges of life and back. Through his most isolating moments, as he journeyed the way of the cross, the journey we acknowledge through this season of Lent, he had to let the Spirit send him, even along the edges so that others, even us, might know the nearness of God and hope, the hope that this presence brings to life, the hope this presence has for life and for all. May that way be our way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as a community of faith, uh, we seek to support the life of the work and the ministry of the church uh, in so many ways, both here and around the globe, through the gifts that we give, uh, through the time that we share, and the lives that we live. And so now let us again present our gifts before God as the offering is received. And uh, you will notice that there are uh, bins on your way out in which uh, offering envelopes can be placed.
Let us pray. O God of new life, out of the abundance of our lives, we offer these gifts back to you. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source of hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand that we might uh, reflect on the words of a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others to seek justice and resist evil, and to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And again, we have this gift of prayer. And let us now open our hearts and minds to God in a time of prayer. O Holy One, in the midst of winter when the days are cold and the wind can pierce, remind us of the warmth of your love and the gift of your presence. In the midst of the winter, as we journey through this season of Lent, when the flowers of spring still lie hidden in the earth, when leaves are still off the trees and the world can seem bleak. Remind us that Easter is but a short time away. And when in our lives we feel as if we are experiencing a season of winter, Help us to know your spirit of life at work in the depths of our being, giving new shape to our living. With an opportunity to once again know of your nearness. For the presence of your Holy Spirit in us, we give thanks. For the words and songs within each of us, we give thanks. And for the lives and the inspiration of all your people, we give thanks. For the life of Jesus, we give you thanks. And for how that life has inspired the witness and the presence of your church, we give you thanks. We give thanks for so many gifts. Gifts of good food and of friendship. The gift of living. Thanks for times shared, times of excitement and pleasure, for times when we can share in our grief and those vulnerable moments along life's edges, places where we discover uh, that strength that is beyond us and your hope in us and for us. Thank you, O God, uh, just for this gift of prayer for the opportunity to have a grateful heart and and what joy that can bring. Help us to lift up, to name, to pause and reflect on the blessings that are ours, the blessings that we have been given. And as we reflect on this grace, may we find our hearts open to see and to pray for the needs of others. Today we lift up concerns and we pray that you be with those and those who need a sense of your nearness in places of conflict, 
places where rules get abandoned in favor of warfare or violence. Be with people who face the adversity of natural disasters and bad weather. We pray for ones who struggle with harsh economic realities, uh, ones who have trouble finding a safe, affordable place to live. We also bring to mind this day prayers for one another, prayers for ones known to us in our family of faith, for ones who are sick, for ones who are in nursing care, for those whose minds and memories have long since been taken from them. We pray for people worn out as caregivers. We pray for parents worn out by the worry for a child, for youth overwrought with concern for the future. We pray for ones who are recovering, ones who are battling for any who are who rise each morning to know another day of chronic pain or struggling to know peace of mind we pray for ones who are dying for those who mourn and we pray for ones on the edges of life and death and we pray especially for the people in concerns we lift up out of our hearts. Oh, holy friend, hear our prayers and answer in your love. And may we continue to discern how we can be the church you would have us be. Help us to be a community open to your transforming love that lends shape to our lives and our living. May we move forward boldly, knowing even through this pandemic time that we are a part of your eternal kingdom of grace. May we find each day sufficient for our needs, find forgiveness when we do wrong, and share forgiveness with others. In times of trouble, may we center our lives on you, for you are love, the love from whom comes the origin of our existence and the strength of our future, the same love you embodied in Christ Jesus, the one who taught his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And I invite you to stand now as uh, we reflect, and you can certainly hum along to our last hymn this day, number 651, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. <laughs>
friends, as we journey through Lent, may God keep our feet firmly in the way Christ leads us. May God help our lips speak the truth that Christ teaches us and fill our bodies with the life that is Christ within us. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may our Lord shower you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. I invite you to be seated and uh, wait for an usher who will uh, uh, let you know when it, uh, you can exit the sanctuary following our post.